everyone. I, I hope you got a glass of pizza. Um, so my name is Enrico. I don't usually give talks, but I recently relocated here in New York, uh, this February, from uh, Sydney, Australia, where I was living for seven years. Uh, I'm originally from Italy. Uh, last time I did a presentation in Sydney, it was like half the people and <laughs> a quarter of the size, but double time the beer. So, and we usually do presentation in pubs in Sydney. Uh, so if you if you go there, you should definitely join the crew. It's it's pretty nice. Um, so I work with Ruby and Rails for the last uh, nine years, and this talk that I'm giving is about uh, Rails engines to uh, feature toggle parts of this application. So I've separated out uh, Rails application components in engines before uh, when working on uh, application dealing with complex domain. Uh, this app didn't have one. Uh, it started as a monolith, but um, a curious requirement came in. Uh, So um, the app had those um, two parts, really, an admin user interface and a, a public user interface. Uh, it was under development for a couple of months, for all, and a total of five developers were working on it. Um, a requirement came in to uh, run the private and public portions of the app on separate servers. Um, the reason for it was a, a policy to lock administration interfaces behind a VPN as well as um, stopping the admin deployments affecting uh, the public portion of the app, as well as to try and separate out the load between the two portions, uh, the public being uh, vastly more popular than the admin. Um, the reason behind the requirement change could be political or technical, uh, but we, um, we really know that uh, sooner or later a change will, will happen, and it's good to take an approach that um, accommodates that. So we had like um, three proposals to, to tackle this. The first was to go uh, service-oriented architecture, um, where two applications, the admin and the public, we talked to some API. Um, that felt a bit over-engineered. Um, we didn't answer how to share user interface components between this public and the admin anyway. The second proposal was to have um, to separate the components of the app, so have a shared um, UI, uh, domain logic, and have two applications using those gems. Uh, we knew that our developments would constantly change those components, meaning releasing a new gem every uh, admin or public update. Uh, we, would, we would also have to update our workflow to ensure that the uh, gem file lock won't be pointing to the local gems uh, and not to check that into version control. The third proposal was to uh, use um, local Rails engine components. So to identify and separate the relevant components from the application and to move them in Rails engine. This solution will diverge a little from regular Rails applications. Um, later in the presentation, I'm going through a few, uh, a few things that, uh, and a few problems and a few solutions to those. Um, so I've done this before and it felt like it was a solid uh, stepping stone if later we wanted to go uh, full service oriented architecture. So we knew about the public and the admin portions, uh, so we started looking for the boundaries in the source code. So the target was to have two engines serving the two portions and be able to mount them programmatically from the main application routes, which is this file here. Uh, the app running mode of value uh, that you can see is just a proxy to an environment variable handling uh, a fallback in case of local development. So admin, nonce, admin, public, public analysis is the fallback. App running mode is the only class that will live in the uh, main uh, Rails application. Everything else will be inside the engines. Uh, this is an example of how uh, the uh, server will be run. So if you set this running mode equals admin by server, uh, that's on the uh, on the uh, super secret uh, private domain, and the public one is just just has running mode equals public. And locally, when you just want to test both without having to, to create and have two service running, you can just omit that variable. So that's the objective. Now, this is a quick uh, description of what Rails engines are. Uh, there will be gems. 
uh, there are special Ruby gems that provide actual behavior, uh, a combination of model, views, routes, great tasks to a REST application. They can be hosted on a gem server, uh, but they can also live inside your repository. And they can be tested in isolation. Uh, so I won't go into the details of creation, creating those engines, but I will point to uh, a link at the end of the presentation. So I'll start focusing on the admin user interface uh, boundary. And I created a component directory in my uh, Rails application, and that's where all the Rails engine will be. And you can call that whatever you want. So sometimes I call it, in the past I call it engines, uh, recently I'll switch to components. So this is the command to create the engine. Um, like I said, uh, I'll point to the Rails guide to get into the detail of the command. Uh, just, a, just a heads up, that command always creates the engine in the route, uh, in the root directory of Rails, so you need to manually move it into components. Now the first step was moving the admin related features specs from the main app into the engine. And this is just a heads up, but proceeding without tests could drive you crazy. Everything I've done with this uh, was an ongoing application, so I moved my specs first and I drove all this refactoring through that. As I was looking in the code, um, I identified the shared user interface uh, elements for some preview shared by admin and, um, and the public facing part, as well as some shared domain. So to reduce the initial scope, I just put all that inside the admin UI. Um, so the admin UI engine uh, is now required by the, uh, by, by the config route. You can see the, this is like a, an interim state where the application relies on the uh, public routes using regular routes, and then it's mounting the admin UI. Now the gem follow the main application is updated to require the admin UI engine. And now the main application was running fine depending on admin UI. So I started moving the public interface from the main app into the engine. Similarly with admin, we moving the feature first. So I created the engine and now the um, main application is relying on the two on the two engines. And the public UI is now relying on admin UI because of the shared UI and domain logic. And this is the gem spec inside the public UI engine. Uh, you can see in the middle there is that uh, require dependency on admin UI. So this delivers the require functionality, but now the two are glued together and the public UI um, really is tightly coupled to, uh, to the public UI. So extracting the domain logic from uh, out of the admin UI is the next step. And again, um, I created the domain logic uh, engine and this, in my case, stores the Mongo documents. Uh, in, in the past, I had uh, it storing the active record models and migrations, as well as uh, other domain logic, uh, Ruby object used by both admin and, and public. Um, admin and public only classes should not be built in here at all. Um, and in my engine test mode, I am loading the Mongo ID, the Mongo ID.yaml from the main application. But I'll get into testing. Uh, now that um, I tackled the shared UI, um, that I tackled the domain logic, the shared UI was next. Similarly, I moved files from admin UI to shared UI. Uh, its purpose was to holding views and assets shared by admin and the public engines. So that now both admin and public UI uh, can use shared UI templates. Um, so those, um, those shared UI with all only views, no models, no controllers, no routes, and um, that's their responsibility. Now, here's a final look at the main application gem file, depending on all the engines. Um, when a couple of years ago I started looking into this, uh, I, I was confused because I expected the admin UI to require the main logic and shared UI, and, and it does that, but it can't find them because they are local dependencies, so you must tell your main application about that position. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Um, in fact, if we remove them, uh, we will get an error saying, um, do not find gem shared UI, which is required by admin UI. That is because of the local path. So now I'm going through a few 
common pitfalls of this uh, Rails engine uh, land. Um, the first is when you are developing your engine uh, and you add the dependency to uh, your other engines down there, you must remember that those are local dependencies. So you will need to update your engine gen file to point to those files, uh, to those locations. Uh, another thing related to this is the required. So when we develop with Ruby on Rails, we, uh, we just rely on uh, Bundler to require all the gems that we have in our gem file. Uh, in our case, we use uh, Gemspan. Uh, so those gems are not required, so you will need to manually require the gems uh, that, your, that your engine uh, relies upon. Then into the test dummy yeah, app, if people have created like engines before, it, they come with those, this test dummy yeah. app. It's a real scale up, the Rails application. Um, you can move in its folder and run Rails server or run Rails tasks. Um, its purpose is to test your Rails engine in isolation. Uh, so when you test a gem in isolation, what you need is that gem. Uh, when you test a Rails engine, potentially your leveraging on Rails. So each engine has its own. Um, uh, Ruby gem spec, so that when bundle and bundle exec R spec it's run is in complete isolation. So the um, the look of the um, of my Rails helper at the top. So instead of requiring the Rails app is requiring the dummy app. In the config boot, uh, the bundle gem file, the gem file that we uh, that we require is the one inside the engine. So the Rails the dummy Rails application will load. Uh, what the engine is relying upon. And then a funny thing down at the bottom is the routes. So the application mounts your engine in that default URL pattern you are. And that could cause a lot of problems because you might expect your feature tests inside the, uh, inside the engine to just mount them in the same position as you mount them in the main app, but that's not true. So you need to remember to, if you mount your engine on slash admin or on slash whatever, to update your uh, dummy app. Other than that, the dummy app is usually not uh, not getting touched too much. Now, testing multiple engines, uh, that's usually done with uh, a build script that runs a uh, bundle exec aspect on each and collects the Unix, Unix return code. Um, recently, uh, I've got through this uh, script from uh, Stefan, a guy that works for Pivotal, and I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it soon enough. So what, what it does, it finds the um, a test file a bash script, and then he basically runs it uh, and collects the results from the main app. So that's actually much slicker than, than my solution where I was running manually and moving manually in the engine. Um, generators uh, use require dependency at the top. Uh, meaning of that is, uh, and I prefer this syntax where with a full namespace application controller in front. If you don't have that, and you just rely on application controller, that application controller could cause flaky tests where in some cases it will load the main application controller of the main app, in some other cases it will load the engines. And when it's the first case, it won't load some of the helpers that you are likely to rely on. So that's another gotcha. Next is on scaffolding and generators. Uh, scaffolding is mostly broken uh, in when, when you use it with um, namespace model names. Uh, so the, the next four slides are, are about errors that, that they cause. So the required dependency has the name space in front of it, so that would cause an error, uh, find and found. Uh, the helpers will be in nested directories, so cause this problem. And this is a big one about the, um, about the paths. So the URL helpers all, are all broken, so it's really not worth trying to use generators. Uh, the Mongo IE generator, uh, it, and again, most of the, some of the generators like this one does something very simple, so it's not even worth looking into why it's broken, it just creates a file. Now, we could have achieved this, uh, this separation by uh, using the same feature flag technique with regular Rails routes on a monolithic app. Uh, the advantage of separating application concerns in engine or gems is to make code more maintainable which is key for a uh, long lifespan of projects, like bigger than a couple of months. Um, it worked well for this. Uh, if we didn't have this separation requirement, I, wouldn't, I would have pulled off on this, uh, on, this, um, on this switch and wait for more complex rules to come in. 
in the past, um, I was working um, at ABC in Sydney and we had a project where the domain logic was very complex. We were building a, a framework for game designers to create HTML and Canvas memory games. Um, that was in conjunction with the University of Melbourne. There was a lot of domain logic and rules, so that project we knew from day one was going to be ongoing and he had a lot of components. So in that case, we started from day one. Um, introducing early could, uh, could help you. It's really up to you what, uh, at what point you want to, to introduce this kind of architecture. I hope this talk will help people tackling uh, these sort of problems and generate some curiosity on the topic. And I'm pretty much done. Feel free to ask me questions here or online. And thanks for listening.